I believe today's episode is going to be all about rigs. Is that right, Pete? Yeah, I thought it would be um, uh, just a different different topic conversation. So I thought for each episode, like the last one, we discussed our photography. Um, we'll try and do a topic per episode and pick each other's brains. Uh, so yeah, this week I was thinking we could uh, have a little discussion about rigs, rigs mechanics, and in which situation uh, you or I would use a certain rig and how we'd apply it. Now I know this isn't something you kind of straight away. I can tell. Like Sam's thinking, here we go. This is this isn't this isn't exciting. So Sam's a bait guy. He'll talk about bait. But um, do you think we can go on this? We we can go on it. Yeah, it's it's rigs aren't my uh my favorite topic, but I think the thing is, you know, for for me, like just different rigs, and you know, do you have your silicon here or do you have it further around? It that's quite boring for me. Um, but what I do find interesting is obviously the application of rigs and presentation. Um, I think it's a huge topic, isn't it? It's not just about the actual rig that you attach on the end. It's it's how you'd apply it and. Um, you know, even things like maybe line lay, we can talk about basically how we present our bait and hook to the carp. I think that's probably more exciting for me <laughs> than just like, you know, rig mechanics per se. So yeah, we'll get into it. Mm-hmm. We'll see where it goes. We'll see what comes out of it. Um, I'm sure we'll go off on a few tangents and, uh, and there'll be some interesting bits. What we got first then, Pete? Oh, actually, tipple, tipple of the episode. You've, mm-hmm. uh, I reckon you've, um, you've got something exciting to tell me about your tipple. You had a glint in your eye when you no. mentioned it earlier. <laughs> no, you don't. No? no, mate. Well, I've got two different drinks tonight. Ooh, so, okay. Yeah. So I've got my uh, my standard sort of rum and coke of late, uh, which I've just got a Cap- Captain De Morgan's uh, with some Pepsi Max, and then the other week I was doing my weekly shop. I've um. Uh, I'm picking up a few bits for barbecues and some barbecue coals and I just got sort of taken back to my childhood to something that my dad would always be drinking I've just got a real memory of this with barbecues I'll show it up to you on our little live stream but look at that a little mini sort of French lager you remember them yes I do yeah old school (laughs) yep yep yeah yeah so I've got a couple of crates of these it's called Argus like Argos, <laughs> but with a U instead of an O. Four percent premium French lager. <laughs> nice, very nice. Yeah, yeah. So you got some the little French ones. Um, what else? Yeah. Oh, and just it was the rum and coke, and that was it. Nice, very nice. Yeah. Funny you say that. I, I usually have a whiskey, don't I? Or la- last episode I had a, a rum. This time I've uh, I've gone for for some ales as well. I've got um, Hooky Gold, um, which is by Hook Norton Brewery, which is a brewery here in the Cotswolds. And I've got a Marston's Pedigree, and I've got a Ringwood Ooh. 49er. Ringwood is wow. Dorset, I believe. So yeah, just got three ales. Um, I've been waiting for Pete to jump on this call for about, I don't know, 45 minutes. So I actually had one before. So I'm, I'm one beer in already. Um and that was actually a Bud Light. I had a few Bud Lights. Not really my kind of thing. Nice. But um, it's just some. I had it for a barbecue the other day. It's a bit of light lager in the sun. Now I'm getting old. <laughs> so yeah, mm-hmm. there we go. <laughs> tipple of the episode. Talking of tipples, this is not really a tipple at all, actually. And in fact, we're going off on a tangent away from rigs already. But I have a uh, a, a bottle of flavour here in front of me. Old school one, Pete. Totally irrelevant to, uh-huh. to our listeners, but. Three. If you get three guesses, you got three guesses, right? If you guess it right, I will. I don't know what it will be. I'll do something really, really cool. Don't know what exactly, or I'll do a forfeit. You choose. You got to guess it. You've just seen the bottle. You've seen the back I, of the bottle there. I didn't see anything. I've just got to guess the flavor. Guess something the- like you would have used in the past when when we were fishing. Uh, yes, something I would. Yeah, yeah. It's an old. It's yeah. I came across it. Um, old flavor, classic old flavor, and it's not a fishy or crustacean type one. How about that? All right. Um, Esther Blend. Nope. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go with it. Is it Rich Worth? Is it one of your Rich Worth flavors? I, we're not doing like process of elimination. You just got to guess. 
Okay. Um, Esther Berry? Nope. No. And I don't know. Some sort of old, like, hutchy chocolate malt or something. No. No. <laughs> go on then. There what we have go. we got? Rich worth two, three. <laughs> when I said rich worth, you could have just sort of gone with it. <laughs> <laughs> I was in it to win it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could tell, giving nothing away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, t- old uh, tutti, uh, tutti Fruity Double Strength Rich Worth. God knows how yeah, old How the old Double Strength. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Going to use it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I use it. I'm more of an I remember you came up with a carbohydrate mix that you kept super secret for your winter bait. Can you remember that? Uh, I remember, yeah, I vaguely, yeah, wouldn't be able to tell you exactly what was in it. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, rem- I remember. Yeah, I do. Okay. So going, going back to this flavor on the last episode, we sort of brought up the, um, soda squid octopus, mm-hmm. um, which really got me sort of, sort of fired up to make, wanting to make a bit of bait. And I have been scouring the internet. Uh, for some of that flavour, so it is nowhere to be found. I've been in touch with Sola, um, who are, assure me they're still producing it, um, but I mean they haven't got it in stock. Nowhere's got it in stock. They suggested a few sort of different different suppliers, but I couldn't get hold of any, um, which is frustrating because I've, I've I've got a few sort of base mix ingredients here, and I could knock something up, have a little play around. Um, the same as you, I've looked all around online, cannot find it. So if anyone knows of anywhere that that stocks um, that stocks the squid and octopus solar squid and octopus flavor, let us know. Just send us a message on Instagram or Facebook. Uh, I think we both want some now, don't we? Definitely. Mm. It's the 100%. koi rara, koi rara as well. It's, it's that's the one, yeah. Has. Yeah. Mm. But yeah, no, it's it's nowhere to be seen. So another thing I was going to ask you, but I've already asked you pre-episode, and you've just been flat out of work, and you've not followed any carp related media i believe um i was going to ask if you'd seen the new terry hearn esp film um which you haven't but it's um it's him out on his boat on the thames again um it's yeah just well worth a watch so when you've got a bit of time on your hands i would seriously recommend yeah absolutely to watch it it's go. I'm gonna do it. I mean, it, it's on my list. I just literally haven't had time. Uh, but I love those Terry Hearn films, um, and actually, the the guy that that films them, and and, and kind of edits them up, and I, th- I think he does everything from start to finish. Uh, Jack Reed uh, is hopefully going to be joining us on the podcast uh, in the coming weeks. Fingers crossed. So yeah, definitely watch it before that. He he is a talented guy. Those Terry Hearn films are absolutely stunning. Um, so yeah, it's on my list, buddy. I'm really looking forward to watching that. But no, I haven't haven't had a chance yet. It came out on Monday, didn't it? Easter Monday. It's uh, mm. Thursday at the time of recording this, isn't it? Um, so no, mm-hmm. no, it's good. I'm guessing. Yeah, mate. No, it's worth a watch. Um, one of the things he stated. So last week uh, we were invited onto the podcast which was good fun um we were asked a question if you could sort of catch any carp or repeat any capture sort of past and present uh what would it be and i was saying about the the, the thames 50 pounder that nick hellier had uh but terry actually said in this video that it's died um <clears throat> yeah and it's been it's been found dead so i don't know i think we, we mentioned that on the podcast but we weren't sure but yeah so which is a shame because that's a special fish a very special fish yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I watched that um, that Nick Hellier one, I literally, that very night, I was looking for boats, <laughs> and, and I still am. <laughs> um, it, I've sort of, uh, me and my girlfriend, I looked at them, and yeah, we'd love to get a boat and, uh, and, and just, you know, go out on these adventures. Totally different aspect to carp angling, isn't it? Um, it would uh you know fishing from a boat and you know that that kind of nomadic roving style of angling yeah. and i just just to- total new kind of dimension to things because i think you know whilst you can go to different lakes and they'll present different challenges 
it, it's a very it, you know it, it's all much of a muchness but something like that I, I think that's really exciting um and actually not to go off on too much of a tangent but that's why i'm uh really you know looking into my river fishing uh, river angling um and, and you know this year i want to get a river carp uh, and i also i also want to um, angle for some barbel as well which I've, I've never caught a barbel in my life um doing most of my angling in cornwall there there are no barbels in in cornwall uh, unfortunately so yeah that's um setting you know setting myself some new kind of horizons with that um and the way i'm gonna angle for them is uh, the traditional uh, split cane and center pin styled approach um so yeah just to just to keep thing things fresh um mm -hmm. and uh and keep things moving uh so yeah yeah anyway we digress has on that has your reel arrived yet i know you ordered one yeah, I've ordered a center pin that that's not arrived. Um, I'm in a bidding. So that was a center pin. Yeah, center pin. I just said that. Um, I'm in a bidding war for a lovely half bay alarm, uh, Mitchell 300 at the minute. Um, so so my, my yeah, my plan is to get um, a nice split cane and center pin for maybe some some chub work, um, and then for for you know the the carp and the barbel. Uh, I'm probably going to go down the route of uh, Dick Walker, um, fiberglass rod. Hardy Walker, uh, fiberglass rod paired up with a Mitchell 300. Still obviously old school and definitely a challenge. Definitely a, a far cry away from, you know, modern rods and reels. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of have a bit of fun with it all. But no, no, my, my center pin hasn't turned up yet. Um, which I should probably chase that, actually. Mm. Yeah. yeah, there we go. Yeah, no. There we go. Anyway, should we get on to this, uh, this rig chat? Why don't we just talk about sort of materials? So, so I guess we'll go into your tackle box. What do you use? <laughs> when I go in my tackle box? <laughs> mm. I mean, look, well, I mean, it, it depends, doesn't it? Uh, I mean, it depends what kind of bottom you're, you're fishing over. Um, it you know, can also depend on what kind of carp you're, you're fishing for. That's uh, something that maybe not everyone... Or that not first occurs to everyone, but um, you know, different fish feed differently. I believe, honestly, that some fish are um, just harder to catch on, say, a, a pop up. If you if you look at fish feed on clean bottoms, some of them are absolutely glued to the to the lake bed. Others will come in and pick up. And sure, that kind of behaviour can be determined upon <clears throat> their feeding habits that day and their mood. But I think just just some fish feed differently. Some of them have got very overslung mouths. I've spoken about this on the podcast before. That fish is going to feed differently than than uh, a fish that's got more of a kind of classic upturned mouth. Not classic per se, but just more of an upturned mouth. I think they're going to feed differently. Um, but yeah, it, it's I've probably got three rigs that I use. Uh, I don't chop and change. I stick to to what I know, and and that that is that really. Um, yeah, it, it's it depends what I'm fishing over mostly you know if i witness carp picking my rig up um and then you know spitting it out um if i'm in a position where i can view them do that then obviously i'll, I'll look to change but generally the rig i use is is determined by you know what substrate i'm fishing over or if i'm fishing in weed etc etc uh, and i guess it's the same with you mate isn't it yeah definitely um i think a, a classic example um is I know it's something I've sort of spoke about before. So going back to, to previous episodes where I've, I say like, I like catching them on my own terms. So quite often I'll have an idea in my head and I want to make that work. And even sometimes when it becomes apparent that might not be the best way to catch the fish, mm. um, I'm quite sort of strong-minded and I'm going to make it work, if that makes sense. So for example, go on interesting I see you're sort of dying to say something yeah give me yeah, an example just... and then and then we'll go for it uh so i mean <clears throat> there's a water sort of say on my club ticket it's got there's a lot of fish in there um lovely clear water and you can you can get them right in the edge feeding you can you can watch um so this is sort of like going back like a number of years now um so for example um i was, I was trying a pop-up rig tying a new rig something i hadn't used before and i was adamant i wanted to sort of play around with this rig and 
start catching fish. Now I can see everything that's going on here. So at the time I was thinking I was, I was feeding some pellet, um, and just like boil, chopped up boily and some whole baits. And every single time they were picking absolutely everything up and then just leaving the the, the, the pop-up every time. And you'd see them they'd go up to the pop-up, they would nudge it around and they're just scooping, they're feeding everything up off the deck. And I'm watching all of this happen, just knowing in my head, I know that if I had a bottom bait on now, I'd be catching fish after fish after fish. Um, but with a pop-up, I was fishing less efficiently. But in that scenario, I want to make it work. So I just persevere on it. And until I catch a fish on it, I, I'm not sort of satisfied. So I can make adjustments. I could, at the time, I think I just shortened the, the, the distance the pop-up was sitting off the lake bed. So I could get it as, as low as possible to the lake bed to make it work for that sort of situation. Um, but I think a lot of the time, if we're fishing over sort of clear gravel, um, especially from what I've witnessed in the edge, I think if you're fishing a clear area and you're fishing popped up, I think a lot of the time you're, you're fishing inefficiently. I know there's a lot of guys mm. out there who would fish pop-ups exclusively for hook baits. Um, I think it's, yeah, I think a lot of the time you're fishing inefficiently from situations like that, from what I've seen. Yeah. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. I think, I mean, just there's two points I want to, touch on there i think pop-ups can pick up the bigger fish um either you know by design or mistake I, I think they for whatever reason that sometimes that can um just kind of single out the bigger fish uh like reduce your bites maybe in that scenario if there was quite a few fish there and you want to uh, maybe avoid the smaller fish i think a pop-up can have its place there where normally it wouldn't be the kind of bottom you wanted to present over. Um, but the real thing I wanted to mention on what you said, uh, or kind of ask you is, why why do you get so hung up on wanting to catch them on a certain rig or method? I mean, a method I could understand, say if you were going out and you wanted to catch, you know, uh, a 30 pound fish off the surface or something like that. Or, I, okay, I get that. But just with a certain rig, I don't understand that. And I'm guessing it's it's, for the accomplishment but surely there's more accomplishment in actually just angling for them the best way possible and adapting your approach to the situation surely that's just kind of better angling and therefore yields bigger um accomplishment i, I don't understand why you wouldn't do that i don't know mate i just get a, i get a little thing in my head and i think if i can make it work um then I think there's a, it's in my head. There's a lot more reward from it. I guess it's just cat, it's how you enjoy your fishing, isn't it? I guess um, another example of it was another sort of farm pond. I sort of fished a few times, and then the uh, the owner of the lake used to tell me there's basically um, a tree that sort of goes out and a big sort of like tree root, and the fish used to come up and they rub on it. And you see them come up and flank and rub their flank on it, and disappear again. And the owner of the lake sort of said. He says, people always put a bait there. You'll never catch a fish from there. He's like, you just won't do it. Um, he was like, they literally use it as a rubbing stick. They're not interested in feeding there. Um, and straight away, I was just sort of like crystal clear water. You can see the fish coming in. I was like, I am putting a rig there and standing on top of it um, until I make it work. And I think, to be honest, it was a struggle sort of getting one to pick the bait up. It took a lot of, a lot of perseverance, but I caught one from there. And it's sort of, I don't know, in my head, it's like a bit of a victory. Um, not necessarily a victory over the, uh, the lake owner, so I could rub it in his face. Um, <laughs> but yeah, um, there's just something in it. There's something I enjoy doing. That. It's sort of like manipulating the fish to feed in a certain way, I guess, or to sort of to feel comfortable to feed somewhere where they may not be sort of comfortable feeding. It's creating that situation. Um, and that's why I like sort of like um, respect like the match anglers as well, because there's a lot of science um that goes into sort of creating that feeding situation and keeping it going as well um trickling in the bait little and often keeping fish in the area i think there's a lot there's a lot to it yeah for sure yeah yeah oh yeah match fishing is um yeah those uh those boys are on it aren't they to coin a phrase for sure yeah yeah i yeah, i'm I think I'm a, I'm dip, I'm kind of the opposite to that in as much as uh, if I saw a fish feeding and it, and it was obviously the wrong rig, I wouldn't hesitate um, in changing rigs to something that was more suitable for that situation. 
Um, yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Neither neither way is right. Yeah. Neither way is wrong. Put it this way: if there was a target fish that I desperately wanted, and that was my goal, was the target fish, and I saw that rig not working, I would change it up straight away. Um, I think fishing like a runs water where I know I can go down and get sort of five or six bites in a in a day um, is a bit different to sort of trying a different approach and doing things a little bit differently, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I get that. I understand that for sure. So, I mean, do, do you are you the same as me? Do you have like a couple of rigs that you just go to <clears throat> or do you have, uh, you know, multiples of, of different styled rigs in your arsenal yeah i've got probably two rigs two. i use a lot i chop and change i would say um from time to time so for example recently you um i used to use say fishing a bottom bait i used to use like the garden mugger hooks remember them mm. That was my that was my go to pattern, um, and a couple of years ago, fishing a day ticket water, um, I just lost confidence. I think I blanked quite an easy water. I probably blanked four or five trips in a row. I was going with a friend quite a lot of the time, who was sort of like get a couple out, he'd get down there and sort of catch two or three, and then I'd be sort of persevering for the day, not catch anything. And you know when you go through a, a phase where you lose confidence, mm-hmm. um, but yeah, just a. And that gun, the, uh, the, my the mugger rig or whatever I can call it, was just a knotless knot. I used to use it with a little bit of silicon on the hook. I've got rid of the silicon. It's such an aggressive sort of angle and things on the hook. I was just, I was just happy knotless knot, and it's done me fine for years and years and years. I still um, use that style of rig today. I, I use a curve shank hook. I don't use the mugger. I've had a few problems where I found. Um, out of the packet, I was getting probably four hooks out of ten that just weren't sort of mm. sharp enough, even when you're touching them up, just not up to the mark. Um, and I also sort of found the interned eye. I just got paranoid that it was too interned. It's so aggressive. Mm. Um, I just got paranoid it was too aggressive and potentially closing the gape of the hook a little bit too much. So I've just sort of moved to a to a normal curve shank hook, just knotless knotted. Um, and I tend to fish just a bottom bait drilled out and trimmed down it depends on the water doesn't it uh, but i'll either fish like snowman set up or i'll fish a single hook bait um really trimmed down drilled out with a bit of bit of cork in there uh, just to balance things out other than that i use a um geez, a multi-rig mate just a simple multi-rig esp stiff rigger hook uh mm. yeah easy Easy. Little bait screw on there so I don't have to faff around with a swivel and floss. Just, yeah, easy. I, I remember... Self. Yeah, I remember you were um, you were quite into the Withy Pool rig at one point. Do you remember? You had... Uh, <laughs> you had quite a reign <laughs> of uh, uh, of using the Withy Pool rig. No, I like the idea of the Withy, to be honest. Mm. I can see how it's sort of um, successful, but it's a lot of... Um, I don't know, clutter almost like around the hook. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Um, for for me, yeah, I just use um, for for my bottom bait fishing. I mean, this is I find this stuff so boring, but uh, there we go. For bottom bait fishing, <laughs> um, I'll just use a um, uh, like a co- uh, a I, would you call it a com a combi uh link in as much as I use some fluorocarbon. Uh, generally this is sometimes i'll just use like a coated braid but a lot of times i'll use a um a piece of fluorocarbon i'll do an all night bra uh sorry all bright knots onto some braid um and you'll remember these rigs pete as i was using these you know back when we were fishing um and then i have a little liner liner uh, sorry not let's knot it onto the the hook obviously have a liner liner um and then i have a little bit of silicon trapping the hair um around the start of the 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 bend of the shank and that's it that, that that's how i fish with i use quite quite big baits um i'm not a small bait guy i, I will use them if i have to um but generally i, I use uh you know bigger baits a couple of baits a couple of tiger nuts on there uh, or a boilie or something 
like that opposed to you know uh, a couple of casters or something <laughs> um so that's it for bottom baits um and then for for many many years i used the the 360 rig um which is very similar to the now popular ronnie rig um the 360 rig wasn't a bad rig it got a bad reputation because the um the eye of the hook was exposed and it used to get caught in the net cord and and it caused damage that way um, but I had my kind of variation of, of the 360 rig, which is basically what, you know, a lot of people would call a Ronnie rig now, slightly different. Um, so I use that for like a lower pop-up. Um, and then if I want a higher pop-up, it's it's a hinge, um, a hinge rig, hinge stiff rig um, is what I use. And do you know what? Sometimes I will fish in like on top of a, a, a weed bed um, and then I'll use a, a chod rig for that. Um so that that and, and that's pretty much me done sure sometimes you know i might want um like a really stiff section on a bottom bait um and then i might just use fluorocarbon all the way through to the hook um with some some uh, shrink tube to kind of get the angle right and 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 then like like a hair tied on sometimes i'll do that um if i want it to be really really stiff on the bottom but generally those three rigs that I mentioned, that just does it for everything for me. Uh, I think, I, for me, I'm more, I'd like more um, to create a feeding situation. And that's probably an overused term. But if you really think about it, um, that that's what it is. Uh, so I'd rather create a feeding situation where they're feeding with gusto rather than trying to, you know, fish for very shy um, so-called biting carp. Um, and change a rig, if that makes sense. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah, what what sort of um, instance would you use uh, a bit of fluoro straight through to the hook rather than combi style, like you described before? Yeah, if they if they weren't moving much, so if they were going down there, there, um, this is on a bottom bait. Say they're not really moving off the spot; um, they're just sucking in close to the lake bed. It's on a clean bottom, like a gravelly um, bottom. Um, yeah, and they're just not moving much and they're sucking very close to it. In that scenario, I would want a stiff, um, a, a stiffer material. Now, I understand some people wouldn't and they'd want a really flexible material so the carp didn't kind of sense it with their mouth. Um, but I, I want it to go in the mouth and be stiff when it's in there stop thinking rude thoughts um so it can't really get out um, by that time yes they'll have they'll have felt the fluorocarbon on their lips but you know the, the stiff nature will in in theory stop it being able to to shoot out um yeah that's 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 what's happening in my head anyway <laughs> uh work, works for me yeah I've, I've caught some fish some fish like that it's not something i, I would do very regularly um, a lot of the time, I don't have the luxury of seeing what is going on. Um, but uh, yeah, that that's the scenario. I would I would go a uh, stiff um, link fluorocarbon all the way through. Mm, it almost um, makes the hook, I think, more aggressive. Almost doesn't it? I guess if you're going stiff all the way through, uh, the hook's at that angle where it's set. I guess. Um, with more rigidity um, yeah I, I like to go combi style i like to have a bit of movement um thing is it, it can be set at the wrong angle can't it yes it's an aggressive thing but if that's facing in the wrong direction it's no good um it's more of the the anti-eject <clears throat> aspect of it that i'm going for so the reason i do that isn't isn't so that there's a more aggressive angle um it's the anti-eject aspect of it, if that makes sense. And in fact, there isn't... When, the way I do it, that's why I use shrink tube on that. I don't have a super aggressive angle on that because I think in that instance, it would actually hamper the hooking. So, you know, if you were to just tie um, some fluorocar a hook on some fluorocarbon with a knotless knot, that's going to be a super aggressive angle. But I radically lessen that sharp angle by having the shrink tube does that make sense Pete? yeah 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 so, no, so i get it i get it um would you ever be what about like an offset hook would you ever be tempted to use something like that i just i don't 
I don't get, I don't understand them. No, no, I wouldn't. Because look, if it's, I don't think this happens anyway, but let's just say uh, the hook sits on the bottom of the carp's mouth and then they move off and it turns. Okay, well, that's great if the point of the hook's facing down. What happens if the point of the hook's facing up? I just don't understand it. I can't get my head around it. Yeah, I cannot get my head around it. I'm not a rig guy, you know. I'm, uh, there's going to be some people that I'm sure would be into it more. Barrance, uh, Barrance is really into different hooks. Um, Barrance Browning, remember him? Um, he might be able to shed mm-hmm. some light on that. I was just talking to him not so long ago, and he said he was he's really finds different hook patterns fascinating. Uh, yeah, but for me, no, I don't. That's not something that that does it for me at all. I know what you mean. It's like 50% of the time it could guarantee you more takes and then 50% of the time it could almost guarantee you less <laughs> or get you less takes. I don't know. Um, sometimes I've, I've been thinking about it a lot recently. Um, you don't see many carp hooks offset, do you? I know Corda do one. Um, I don't think any of the other brands really do offset hooks. Um, someone might sort of get in contact and correct us. Um, so what, what hook patterns are you using? Bottom bait rigs, what are you using these days? Well, I've actually just started, um, like, well, I say experimenting. I'm not actually using them out there because obviously we're in a lockdown at the minute because of the coronavirus. Um, but I've started to pay a lot of attention and I've got a few packs of the ESP Trig Hammer. That is a pattern I like. I don't know if you've got any of those, Pete. If you don't, I'll, I'll, I bought a few packs. I'll send you a pack if you want, mate. Um mm. But they are interesting hooks. Yeah, I like them. Um, but apart from that, I think we've spoken about this before. I, um, I'm a big fan of really sharp hooks, but I'm awful at sharpening hooks. So um, I get the um, the Corda ca- Kamakura, are they called? I think they're called Corda Kamakuras. They're like ready sharpened, basically. Not a big fan of Corda hooks. Sorry, mm-hmm. Corda. Um, I, I wouldn't be using them if they weren't you know, very, very sharp. Um, so yeah, I use the wide gate, which is a beak point, which I, I'm not a big fan of beak points. Yeah, you know, big gravel pits where there's going to be a lot of movement of the rig. They're, they're, you know, potentially better. They potentially blunt less. But other than that, I prefer a straight point on that kind of hook. But nonetheless, I, you know, the only Kamakura Why, why patterns, are you using them? The, well, I'm just answering that, Pete. The only Kamakura okay. patterns um, that they do are the wide gapes, um, the stiff rigger. I think that's it, actually. I think it's just those two that they do. Um, so to answer your question, they're the only hooks I use because they're the only sharp ones I can get. Um, if there was another brand that, that did some different patterns that were as sharp as those, I'd be using like um, a, a, just a classic um I tell you what hook I do like actually is the uh, Nash Twister hook. It's not as sharp as the Corda Kamakuras, but the actual pattern I like it. It's a wide gaping hook, quite an aggressive eye. Um, yeah, I like I like that hook. I used to use those hooks. Um, and then other than that, just just like a general um, stiff rigger hook, ESP Mark II stiff rigger hook is what I used to use before um, Corda brought out these real nice sharp ones. Mm. I, f- I think the ESP hooks, those stiff rigger hooks, are super sharp in my experience. I haven't bought any now for many years because I've had sort of plenty in the tackle box, but I find they're super sharp. I mean, com- comparing, look, I, I, they're, those they're great hooks, you know, um, sort of almost classic hooks now, aren't they? Um, they've been going quite a while, mm. but they are nowhere near as sharp as the quarter ones. They just they just really aren't. Um, so, nope. nope. Absolutely not. No. So for me, um, it's it's got to be those pre-sharpened uh, quarter hooks. Unfortunately, still trying to get my girlfriend to to sharpen hooks, <laughs> but uh, yeah, hasn't happened yet. <laughs> I can't do it. Honestly, I'm what like about a baboon. The... It just doesn't work. Yeah, we we spoke about this on other pods. So I don't want to sort of go over old ground, but we spoke about like the gardener point doctors. I think they do two different types now, even for hooks straight out of the packet. Just a couple of sort of you just rub it over the point a few times and it just makes it super sharp and you can't do it with that one either you were saying no no i can't yeah what about the nash hooks they're sort of all pre-sharpened now is it like pinpoint they've got a 
that German chap, Mark somebody. Um, Mark Vusen. His company sort of is. Yes, that's it. He, they've joined with Nash, haven't they? But have, you, have you looked at those? Are they not sharp? Um, I'm I'm not saying they're not sharp, but they're they're not not as sharp as the uh, the quarter ones. Sound like a quarter fanboy here. Mm. Um, it, it's just that no, yeah. they're not as sharp as those quarter ones. No, no way near, no way near. Um, I, oh, to be fair, I've only looked at one point, uh, one pack of the point, um, the the point, whatever it is, Nash point, on point. What are they called? I can't remember. But uh, no. Point. Pinpoint, that's it. Sorry, yeah. Nash pinpoint hooks. I've only looked at one of their packs, um, and it's no, it's not as sharp as the quarter ones, unfortunately. If it was, I'd be moving across to them. And um, going talking about the twisters as well. That was something else I tried. I think it was last summer, to be honest. Um, when I was having a bit of a bit of a confidence issue, I actually bought the uh, the twister long shanks that they brought out. Um, actually, talking about sharpness. I found actually quite a few hooks out of the packet not sharp enough. Um, I think quite a few of those didn't even make it onto rigs. Um, like a quite high percentage of the hooks in the pack didn't, yeah, make it, make it onto rigs. So yeah, I hear what you're saying. I'm super fussy about it though. I think I'm too fussy. Um, but there we go. So you mentioned earlier you were talking about um, different fish feeding. Uh, I know you're talking about, for example, sort of like big fish. Is there any sort of, if you were targeting a, a big a big fish, a certain fish, um, is there a go-to sort of big fish rig for you? Um, <clears throat> I mean, it's been said so many times, but a uh, hinge stiff rig is, you know, um, a, a real solid rig that God knows how many big fish have been caught on. Um, other than that, not, not really, mate. No, not, no. To answer your question, no, it depends what I'm fishing over. Um, if I, if I'm in a situation where I can see them feeding in a particular way, then sure, I'll change it for that. Um, or if the, 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 the fish I'm targeting has got a particular, you know, if it's got a very, very small mouth, for example, so if it's a real weird fish or it's very overslung or something like that, then, then I'd, I'd change maybe excuse me burping as i talk um but other than that no not really big hooks i'm a big hook user i've spoke about this many many times um but uh, yeah i like a big hook i think you're fishing for big fish you need a big old hook um you know you, you look at a, a size four hook in a in a big fish's mouth it's just lost in there you know yeah yeah, no, no, we, we we sort of um we sort of touched on that before, haven't we? Yeah, you're um, a small hook man, aren't you? Well, I tend to go up to a size six, and I'd use a size four on a pop up, um, and we sort of we've we've, we've yeah gone over that. Are you talking about sort of fish with overslung mouths, and how you'd fish for them differently than say sort of like a a normal carp to something with a really exaggerated overslung mouth, um. I think you put a photo of a fish up on your Instagram a little while ago with a fish with quite an overslung mouth, didn't you? Yeah. Um, how would you approach a fish like that if that was your target fish? How would you approach that differently to say something um, normal? <clears throat> well, that, that fish with the, the, the quite overslung um, mouth, I actually caught on a on a chod rig fishing in over quite deep weed. Um, it's a deep, deep old lake. <clears throat> um but yeah was, uh, that that was that was fished uh just bare on the line naked chod you'd call it on a chod rig over the top of the weed um i i think in that kind of scenario the shape of the mouth would be less of an issue or less of a factor than it would do if it was hard on the deck so to speak um if 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 a fish was it, say if a fish had an overslung mouth and it was feeding on on clear uh, gravel, right? Which is what most well, it's what a lot of us are fishing over. Um, then generally you, you're going to find it's it the fish doesn't up it's not as upended or it, it's not as acute an angle to the lake bed. It's generally a little bit more uh, flatter to the lake bed if that makes sense. Um, and on. I feel you need probably a, a bit of a shorter hook link rather than a, a, a fish that, that kind of upends 
to go onto the onto the the bait and pick it up if that makes sense yeah no i uh i get it i get what you're saying what about you um what do you mean well i mean how, how would you target a, a fish with a particularly overslung mouth honestly i don't i i it's a scenario i've never ever i've never targeted a fish with a really overslung mouth I've caught plenty of fish with overslung mouse and I've caught them in the exact same fashion that I've caught any other fish. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. I think we can we, we we can all sort of like look into it uh a bit much. Um going sort of like to to I guess rig materials and things. Can you remember the old PB jelly wire? I used to love PB jelly wire. Yes. Yeah, I do. Why'd you ask? Well, you can't get it anymore. Oh. Okay. Um <laughs> and I've still got some uh, and I use Ooh. it a lot. Uh, it's perfect because you can strip it easily when you pull a knot down tight. It doesn't break the coating of the braid. It sort of maintains its sort of like stiffness. Um, and it's it's stiff, but it's supple and it's easy to use. And I haven't found a product anywhere near like it. I um, was listening to one of the carp casts uh, with Jamie Klossick. Uh, and he was talking about the uh, PB products, Jelly Wire, and how it's stopped. And I know he's a Nash angler or he was a Nash angler. Um, and he was saying he'd use their skin link or something. And he said it was like the perfect replacement um, and how much he loved it. And I've bought some of that and I really, really dislike it. I think I've got the 20, probably 25 pound. It is chunky stuff, really chunky um, and an absolute bitch to strip. Uh, you need a stripper tool, really, if you're tying lots of rigs up in a row. Um yeah, not easy to use. Uh, so I didn't know what you were using, and if you had any sort of recommendations for me. Uh, no, um, I use the um, ESP fluorocarbon ghost, soft ghost. Mm-hmm. Um, used that for years. And then the braid, to be honest, the, the braided section, I'm not, I, I can't, I'll use whatever I've kind of got. That That bit doesn't bother me too much. Um, I like, I tell you what though, I do like, um, I like a, a, a tighter weave rather than like the old, I'm trying to think of the old, um, Christon braid that was like a, a real loose weave. I d- don't like that stuff. Mm-hmm. The, the tighter stuff is, is what I like. Um, if that makes sense. Yeah, you, I don't think they make them like that anymore, do they? I think most of them are like a nice tight weave nowadays. Yeah, the one I use, which I also can't remember the name of, is is a tight one. Um, I also actually, if, if I do use um, like a, a, a sheathed material, a sheathed braid, um, I like the ESP. Again, I don't know the name of it. I'm so bad with names. I'm sure everyone's like <laughs> quite annoyed at this, but the ESP um, coated braid that that's in, it's like a like a two color thing. So it's like, I, I like the gravel one. So it's like brown and then lighter brown. It's like a, do you know what I mean? There's like two different tones of color going on. Um, yeah. And the actual inner braid is actually quite stiff in that, but I don't mind that. Uh, I don't don't mind that at all. Yeah, I quite like that stuff. Um, but yeah, but but soft fluorocarbon wise, uh, I like the AS, ESP stuff as well. Um, and I know that's called soft ghost. That is something I can tell you. What was the one that was doing rounds a number of years ago? And that was a that was a it had a fluorocarbon core. Can you remember that? And a braided exterior? No. No, I don't remember that. Yeah, I can't remember the name of the I'll have to bring it up on the next pod. I'll do some research. A fluorocarbon but yeah, it had a fluorocarbon core. core. Yeah, and a braided exterior. What what's I always what? like the the look of that and the idea of it because um, it had its sort of stiffness and then you used to be able to almost like you could with lead core you know what I mean where you're splicing your lead core or whatever um, you can always like you push the fluorocarbon out of it and cut that back so then you had like a nice supple section by your hook so um, so you'd use it in in reverse so to speak no. What do you mean? So I don't know. I'm I'm stupid. I don't understand it. <laughs> you, you, the 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 inner is the hard bit, is the the stiffer bit, and the outer is the softer bit. Yeah. So so. Right. See, so 
that's kind of the opposite. So for a, Sorry, my brain's well, melting here. <laughs> yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Um, so like the, the fluorocarbon, say you wanted a stiff boom section, you're just yeah. going to tie it up normal, yeah. and then you can poke the fluorocarbon through, cut it back, and then you've got a nice supple section um, for like your combi braid area right. up to the hook. Uh, I think you could use it in multiple different sort of guises. A bit of a gimmick, my, no doubt. I can't remember the name of the company. I think it was, I don't know if it was Christon. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, cool. You never used it then? Never used it, <laughs> mate. No, never used it. No. Uh, but I think sort of when it when it comes to rigs and stuff, I, I a lot of the time goes for the easy option. So like you're saying, we've, uh, I've used fluoro combi rigs um in the past with a with a with a braided sort of supple section uh but when it comes to tying rigs and it's not my most favorite job in the world i find it quite painstaking um so i stopped doing it purely for for ease of use so i always just use sort of like a coated braid with a supple section uh, for pretty much all my bottom baits um the only time i would use a, a supple braid now is if i'm sort of stalking in the edge and it, and it suited it I like the stiff section, like you're saying before. I like to know that, that the rig sort of resets itself. Um, so that's quite important. I quite often balance my hook bait again. So if I get ejected, I've just got a bit of confidence that it's sinking down away from the lead uh, with a supple section of braid. Uh, so that's sort of sort of what I go for. Um, Pop-up wise, I'm saying I use a multi-rig again. Always use it super, super balanced so it resets itself. And yeah, as long as my rig's resetting itself, I'm I'm sort of happy. Unless I'm stalking close in, and then I can see what's going on, so I'm not too worried. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that, that's it, really, for rigs, isn't it? I don't know how how much more we can we can chat about it. What what kind of um yeah no exactly? Do you find that you stick with a certain um presentation, like a helicopter rig or or like a, a lead clip or yeah, paternoster. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> what what do you uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. When yeah. I'm tying my snood. Um <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, my go to ledger setup, uh I fish helicopter. Um at the moment. Um you, I just like the like the flexibility of it. Um you can adjust how far uh up your leader or main line um you wanna set the you want to set the hook, uh, so I, I I go for a, a helicopter rig these days. Um, I used to fish leg clips exclusively because um, I like the idea of dropping the lead, uh, fish safety. Um, but now I tend to use the quarter, like heli safe system. Uh, so if I want to drop the lead, I can do sort of quite happily if I if I get a fish. Yeah, that's that's pretty much my go to setup now for bottom baits, pop ups. It's what, it's what I do. Awesome. I've actually realized that just across from my desk, my uh, my tackle pouch resides. So I've just gone and picked it up. And uh, yeah, and there we go. What were you saying, mate? <laughs> what did I miss? <laughs> you, just, you just wandered off, didn't you? Uh, I, t- I tend to fish um, heli- helicopter. Helicopters, yeah, it's me too. Styly these yeah. days. I think this is that because they're they're safer, or is it just because you f- you fish quite silty waters, right? I do at the moment. Yeah, yeah. So is it is it it's is it because it, of the silt factor? Is it a presentation factor? It, it it's presentation rather than carp safety. Because I mean, I th- I think the helicopter rig is is obviously the safest, providing that hook link can can slide off freely. You you, you can't get any safer than that, right? No. No, I'm with you. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely. I know we were discussing before. You you sort of fish, I guess, what uh, quotation terms naked uh, these days. I use um, where I can like the uh, the unleaded sort of lead core leaders, like the braided leaders. Um, um I don't. But... Yeah, yeah. Yes. Sorry, mate. Yeah. I don't always. I'll, I'll I'll use like a fluorocarbon leader if, if I need the abrasion. But yeah, I don't. I don't like um, actual leaders per se. Yeah. What sort of pound fluorocarbon are you using? 
do you know what? i i just again i get this paranoia of like twist in my leader and i don't i like with these unleaded ones is you eliminate the twist and provided everything sort of settled as it should be i think it's hugging the deck quite nicely um i think with fluorocarbon i get paranoid i really do that i've just got bits of line hoiked up with the the twist from the reel um so i try and stay away yeah um i don't i mean i don't i don't have leaders that are long enough to go onto the reel if that makes sense it's it's literally just like the last the 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 last bit um so it's it's not like i've got it all coiled out around my reel um but uh yeah just like 25 pound um fluorocarbon work works absolutely fine for that to be honest mate uh shouldn't shouldn't give you an issue how long a lead are you having is this like a shock leader for casting or or, or just a leader for for con concealment and abrasion yeah concealment and abrasion um poor i'd say no more than 24 inches um yeah about two foot probably so what what why is what why is that's not on your reel i don't understand what you're on about yeah, I think you still get the twist. I think the twist comes through. The, do you know what I mean when I've used it before? It comes through the like the curvature of the line comes through. And you I think really struggle it, with twist, don't you? Like phenomenally. I just so. don't like it. Yeah, I think it's a mental thing more than anything. I just don't like it. Just don't like it. Yeah, I don't know what to tell you, mate. We've spoken about line twists so many times. I'm sort of fed up of it. <laughs> just, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have the issues that you have. Uh, it's probably because you've got these silly little freaking Western spools. That's the problem. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah, there we go. Something else I've just got um, to play around with is um, Thinking Angler's Think Link, which is like a low memory um, hook link. Which is it's quite nice stuff actually. Uh, can't say I've used it in anger yet, but yeah, looks quite nice. And there we go. There's so, so what much. Is that? Sorry, there's so much tackle, isn't there? Uh, thinking anglers think link. Um, it's it's like a, is that is a, that braid? No, it's it's not fluorocarbon. It's like um copolymer or or whatever. Um, yeah, it's just a low memory hook link. Uh, low men memory mono or something. I don't know what it is. Yeah, it's it's no, it's not a braid. It's a, it's like a mono, monofilament. Um, something mm. else that I that I use for my my chod section, um, or hinge stiff or whatever is a uh, quarter mouth trap. I really like that stuff. I know some people don't like it, um, but I do like the quarter mouth trap. I think it's uh it's really good stuff. I use it in twenty five pound. It's nice and stiff the way i like it would you, would you use that on a hinge for like a, the boom section as well or is that just a bit too, yeah no 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 too stiff yeah sometimes i do so sometimes i'll use it as the boom section um sometimes i'll use the the um the soft ghost if i want it more well soft uh the soft ghost i've got is 15 pounds i'm looking at it now in front of me <laughs> um so no yeah it, it as always it, it depends um but yeah, I don't mind having... See, sometimes with my hinge stiffs, I actually like a really short boom section. So it's almost... I guess it's almost like a choddy, but with an extension section to a, to aid movement, you know, lift, lifting up, sucking in, basically. Um, sometimes I'll have the, that section quite short, actually. Um, and, and sometimes I'll even use a... I think, well, actually, is a, a great thing is actually think of a hinge stiff, but... So the, the chod section is av as normal, you know, it's a very stiff bristle type filament. Um, and the boom section, actually having that as braid, soft braid, I think that can actually be a really good rig. The only issue is casting that out, that that is going to tangle like, you know, your granny's knickers or whatever. That's probably not a good saying. Um, sorry to your grandma. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's going to it's going to it's going to really tangle a lot. But I think actual mechanic wise and and uh, an efficiency of hooking, I think that's an interesting rig. It's something I it's something I think about a lot, um, and I don't know that someone might be 
doing that and they might be all clued up with it. I don't know. It's it, I've never seen or heard it being done before, but um, it works well. Uh, it's interesting. It interests me. It's, it's one of those that interests me. I'd like to use it more, but it's just the confidence because of tangles, etc. Yeah, I think something like that, it could work better on like a um, like an inline or a lead clip setup rather than being fished sort of on the line with a soft section like that. Mm, I think why? a lot of the time, like with a choddy and stuff, you're relying on the resistance of the line for, for that sort of like the hooking. Um, and it almost, I think that makes it sometimes more difficult for the fish to eject a rig, especially with a stiff section of a chod. And then you've got that sort of resistance of the line. So no matter where they're going, they're always getting that sort of, that initial phase where they're picking up the hook bait. They're mm. getting that, um, I don't know, just like that, that, constant resistance they can't shake the lead they've got nothing to sort of uh to play with so i think that sort of um i think a that soft section of braid on a on a helicopter setup or you're fishing naked on your line might sort of negate that a little bit but i think if you are to do it down by like the hook section it could be like something a little bit different um yeah i get what you're saying you never see anyone fishing popped up off the lead anymore do you um no you don't no no that was uh short rip zig isn't it have you used zigs much see that's something that does interest me but i'll be i'll i'll admit i just don't have the balls to fully commit to zigs and i don't know if it's going and back to what, this. going back to what you were saying about catching them on your own terms um i could i don't wouldn't feel like that was catching them on my terms I, it would feel like it was just sort of like chucking something out there and hoping for the best i think there's a bit of science behind it isn't there and i say this to myself quite often that um close to me there's a there's a bit of a runs water like a day ticket water and i've said to myself do you know what i'm gonna go up there with three rods dedicated to zigs just catch a few fish and get a bit of confidence sort of figure it out um and then when i go up there i just sort of end up catching on the surface because i enjoy doing it and probably one of the only waters i go to where i can go up there and have a bit of fun doing some surface fishing <laughs> and it happens every time but i should do that i should go up there three rods just dedicate to just trying out different depths uh just seeing how i get on i do like the idea of you see like the uh people spotting over zigs as well i can see it being really effective i think you've got to be fishing the right kind of water for that though you've got to be fishing a, a water that's got a, a high stock of fish and I think that's playing in your favour. A lot of the waters I fish, I just don't think it would be overly suitable. I think zigs could work at the right time of year, and I think I'm probably stupid for ignoring them, a lot of the waters I fish, but like you say, it's having the balls, isn't it? It's something you're not used to, and you've got to sort of just like break the mould and get to grips with it. My yeah. time on the bank's precious as well, so I don't want to be getting, for example, the winter just gone, where I'm getting to the lake at dark, I do my overnight. I pack up in the morning when it's barely light and then take the kids to school. I want to try and catch a fish and I'm doing what I'm confident in. Um, I don't really want to chuck three zigs out there and my my sort of one night a week be sort of, yeah, unsure of what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah, you're, you're and you're very much not a risk taker, are you? You're, you're, you're Mr. Play It Safe. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I'm the same in that respect. I wouldn't want to bang one out and then uh, I wouldn't fully commit to it like every rod on a zig. Yeah, I'd find that hard. But um, yeah, I guess maybe the way to do it is just to, you know, ha- have your third rod um, on a zig and then see, you know, if it starts taking off. But th- that being said, I think you've got to commit yourself to it, right? Um, I think you've got to like, you know, alter the depths and really try and, you know, find what level the fish are at and I don't know. I'd almost like to, to sort of commit to just fishing with zigs for a few months or even a year, you know, get to learn the different seasons and how they respond. Um, can you imagine just fishing zigs for a whole year? You'd still have tons to learn about zigs and, and getting the sixth sense for, for where they'll be, etc. But still, you'd learn a lot, wouldn't you? I wonder how. I wonder. I wonder what the result would be. I'd wonder if you'd catch more or less. That's an interesting one, isn't it? 
Because I could, I could see yeah, it going I either just, way. Yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I really do. Um, I just don't, wouldn't want to do it. I like bait as well. <laughs> and I like, like I was saying before, I like getting that spot going. Uh, yeah. Um, I've been on fish with Ziggs before. The, I had one night um, at a local water where I was just, I was adamant. Look, I'd fished it a few, I fished it quite a few times. And I always see fish sort of moving off an island. Um, and I was fishing sort of just, I think, I don't know, probably five, six foot of water. And I was fishing about a foot under the surface. Mm -hmm. um, and I just caught roach after roach after roach. I was fishing just a little bit of yellow foam. And yeah, I was catching some big old roach. Um, yeah. And that's the only fish I've caught on a zig. What What about um, floater fishing? I know that's something that you've done a fair bit of, isn't it? What I, and, and it's something I'm not very good at. Um, I think if me and you went and, <laughs> and had a little floater fishing competition, I think you'd probably wipe the floor with me, mate. What What is your setup like? What from start to finish? Uh, so light mono. I can't remember the the exact mono I've got on my floater rod. Um, I can't remember the name of it. It's like a, it's a casting mono, super supple. Uh, I think I've got it in like twelve pound, might be ten pound, something like that. Um. And then I use a like a the, the corder sort of bolt machine type float, like the distance casting float. So I used to use like the old Drennan controller. Remember those? Like a big bubble underneath. You got like the little the little orange stick above. Yes. Um, and I persevered with them for years and years. And then I moved across to this corder like bolt machine. I don't know what they're called. And uh, oh my god, did it transfer like or transform my fishing? <laughs> it may, really? it just does the work for you i've got to say yeah um i've got some sort i don't even know i haven't got my tackle box in front of me um it might be a quarter line again it's like a dedicated floater and zig line um which is probably an eight pound or something like that and i i know lots of people use like a six foot trace or something but i find i don't i, I like to use something sort of like two and a half foot maybe to three foot because um, I like to eliminate any slack in that line from the float to the hook bait. I want that to have as little slack as possible. So similarly to like a rig on the bottom, as soon as a fish sucks it in, they're feeling the resistance of the float straight away. Okay. Um, yeah, and I always take a little bit of Vaseline. and also I've got some, from my fly fishing day, some Mouchelin or whatever it's called. I can't remember the name of it. Just some sort of grease. Uh, and you just I always sort of grease up my my hook length um, so your hook length is always on the surface of the water and I do that with a section of a uh, main line as well from the float back um, I find as soon as you start your, your hook link starts sinking through the water column or your main line from the float um, coming back then you really start to spook the fish but yeah no I um I really enjoy it my my floater fishing um, do you know what? I've got a friend. So there's this the same lake I was mentioning earlier, which is a, it's a real runs water around here, and um, we we went up there for a while. We used to go up there late at night. He had permission to fish it. It's a day ticket only. He had permission to do nights on there, and we used to go up there in the winter, probably from about seven o'clock, and fish till midnight. And he used to turn up, and I'm bearing in mind, like we are talking clear, clear skies. And I'd sort of have my little tub of pop-ups, like travel real light, like one rod, like a little like PVA bags of pellet or something like a pre-tied. And I'd be chucking like my little pop-up around and nick a bite or two. He went up there with a loaf of bread. And I was just like, man, this guy's having an absolute laugh. I was just like, he is a, such a noddy. <laughs> I was just like, what is he doing? And um, went up there with a loaf of bread. And it is cold, like minus temperatures. Your landing net's frozen on the deck. And he's literally throwing out slices of bread like full slices and he's just like frisbeeing them out into the lake into the pitch black and i'm like he's floater fishing in the dark i'm like it's december what is he doing and all of a sudden you just hear the fish like <laughs> hey and they're going crazy for it and there's frost <laughs> on the ground like my landing net's frozen 
Yeah. And he's literally chucking out slice after slice after slice, and the fish just go absolutely mad for it. Um, and then, yeah, he would literally <clears throat> um, cast out, and he'd stick his rod <laughs> on the bite alarm, float a set up, and <laughs> a chunk of bread on the hook, and he'd just catch fish after fish after fish. Like, you couldn't see what was going on. He's just chucking out into the middle of the lake. But, yeah, just a random story I've got there. Just, yeah, it took me completely by surprise i can compl- you know when you judge a book by like, its cover mm-hmm. and i'm just like this guy is clueless the first time we went up there i was like oh god like he really talked a good game <laughs> when we were talking about fishing at work wow and yeah i was like he is clueless but yeah he showed me wrong there we go who is it do you want to name him yeah my mate jordan um you know sort of uh yeah fish with from time to time hmm. He's my, my, my fishing buddy down here. Nice man. Um, See, it's it, interesting you say. Yeah. Interesting you say that about um, the the controller. Do you remember those? Um, what was that? What was that like? It, it was a runs water. It's where people used to go just to like you know get a load of fish or or try a new bait maybe or something. And that guy used to have that really innovative. Uh, sorry, I can't say that word. <laughs> innovative. Um, Oh, you know what I mean, don't you? Yeah. You know what I mean, don't you? Smugglers. Smugglers, that's it. Good old smugglers. Yeah. Smugglers, is, for the listener, it's kind of venue. It's, uh, I don't know, was it like two acres? I, I don't know. Um, and uh, yeah, quite a few fish in there. It's just classic runs water. Um, and yeah, the, the fl- that floater fishing setup that guy used to have, and he used to sell it really effective really efficient wasn't it incredibly so <laughs> why yeah. don't why don't we use that <laughs> God. On, on, on better water on like i say better waters but i wouldn't dream of casting that freaking thing out it looks crazy i wouldn't <laughs> dream of casting that out on like on a on a cotswold pit but do you know what probably do really well you'd get um, some looks i'd get some Mate, looks that was yeah, yeah. Jesus, he used to take, like... So, basically, he had converted some sea gear, wasn't it? It was all sea fishing gear, to the point of even his rod rest was a spike in the ground with a big tube on it. So, the top of that tube was probably sitting four to five foot high. So, your rod tip is, like, a 12-foot rod, like, nigh on, fucking 20 foot up in the air. Um, Can you remember that? Yeah, I remember that. I think yeah. that was key. Yeah. You had to have that your was rod key. tip like yeah. really, really high. Yeah. And he basically had like the line or like straight through to a sea fishing float, wouldn't it? Like a big chunky like like a two ounce lead would probably cock this thing. <laughs> um and then the line straight through down to the lead. So basic effectively, uh like you were saying earlier, like the lead was on the bottom, he was ledgering, like old school style. And then he had his float on the surface and then there was like a, a, a swivel or something on the line fishing helicopter style. Yeah. I can only assume it. Uh, with yeah. his... It's been done. It's 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 kind of, I wouldn't say it's a well-known thing, but it is, it's been publicized and stuff. It's just the way he did it was <laughs> blatant. There was, yeah. There, yeah. Nothing, nothing subtle about, about that guy set. Was it? The float was freaking huge. Um, it's like a he large was bailiff, sea fruit, uh, sea float. Yeah, he was the bailiff. Yeah, he really. I can't remember his name. Nice guy. Uh, Mel. Was it? How God, you got a good memory. Mm. We didn't fish it. We didn't fish it that many times, did we? But it's a good, good place to go and bag a load of fish to try a new no, bait yeah. or something. Or <laughs> yeah, <laughs> God, good old days. Do you remember? Mate, old... That was. You remember Mike from the tackle shop? All, spe- yeah. all species, Mike. Yeah, he was all right. I'll never forget the time when you. <laughs> I don't know if you remember this. Good. Like okay. you wanted a flat pair lead. You wanted an inline lead, like a flat pair, and they only had square pairs. And he was just literally like, "It doesn't matter." And you're like, "Well, no, it's all right. I can't, or, you know, I really want like a like a flat pair. I'm fishing sort of like a steep marginal shelf. I want it to sort of um, <laughs> like to grip." And can you remember when he took a hammer? to the square pair led and he just obliterated this thing just to flatten it out 
Do <laughs> you remember what? that? No. And then sold it to me. <laughs> Yeah, you had to buy it. Mate, he went to like 20 minutes of effort to flatten this lead out so you felt (laughs) obliged to buy it. (laughs) No, but it doesn't surprise me. No, it doesn't surprise me at all. He was a freaking character, to say the least. But but such a Mm. like such a nice, helpful guy. Wasn't he? He he would he was a character. I'm sure he's still is. But he, he he would do anything to help you. Like he he was just a a lovely guy perfect kind of guy to work in a tackle shop to be honest wouldn't he um it was his life yeah he actually was yeah mm. he was a keen fisherman through and through and i think it just suited him to the tea didn't it it did yeah um that mate, sad sad news is i think that shop is no longer in existence i think it closed down yep um yep i went last year sometime no before that i i went back um probably two years ago um getting on for three and and yeah i was in i was in newquay and uh walked past it and yeah, it was all shut down then so no it's been shut quite a while mate um mm. it sort of yeah it, it kind of like brought a, a tear to my eye almost to be honest with you that shot um that was like I, I think that was probably the first fishing shop i went into when i got into carp fishing um went in there i think that was the first place it was a lot bigger back then i don't know do you remember when it was it was like it was quite big and then they they halved it didn't they maybe 10 years ago yeah made a cafe probably more one pro- side. probably more than 10 years ago now yeah yeah they and they made it half the size it was yeah rollies wasn't it rollie the guy who used to own it before That's it. <clears throat> um yeah it's just sad you know it was quite sad i'm super nostalgic and and uh <laughs> with stuff like that anyway but yeah i found it really really sad that that, that place had shut down um who is the owner the the last owner of it quite a, quite a young guy our age can't remember his name yeah no nor can i i remember i went in there once uh it was one winter depths of winter whether it had been christmas or something i had some money and i bought my first set of delkins mm. um, and i went in there and bought some delkins and i think business had been <laughs> It was it was tough, yeah. And he was so thankful for me for buying um, a set of well, a couple of Delkims and a receiver or something. Yeah, um, yeah. I think down in Cornwall, you're not getting a lot of trade as an angling shop, uh, especially with the online markets nowadays. You you you've got to be online, I think, and even then, you've got. I mean, to to compete with Total Fish and Tackle and Angling Direct, you've got to be doing something on that note actually totally impromptu plan to do this but um bankside tackle good old bankside tackle um run by uh john finch and obviously ian pool in there as well they are doing some funky stuff on tiktok uh, you know what tiktok is don't you pete it's this new social media platform yeah it's just basically yeah it's full of like my wife had me trying to do some horrible dance in the garden the other day. I was just like, no. It's full of nope. It's full of like young girls shaking their tits and ass. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I, and and but ba- yeah, they're they're doing some uh, some like uh, real innovative marketing on there. So um, yeah, r- full respect to them. Um, but yeah, I guess on that note, you you always you want to try and support your local tackle shop, don't you? Um, you know, rather than always going to the 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 big guys, who do you know what? I I bet I you know I bet they're they're struggling right now as well. But um, yeah, I always Gosh, I don't know yeah. about you, mate. I I I'd rather spend a few quid more and and support a local shop, an independent rather than uh, than than one of the bigger companies. Yeah, it's um yeah funny old times, isn't it? Funny old times. I actually bought online. Oh, mate, this is going back a number of weeks now and it's not arrived yet like the old school olive green like esp bucket sun hat you know the one i'm talking about uh my old hat you remember i used to wear that was yours what was it an esp one (gasps) you remember my old fishing bucket hat yeah of course it was an esp one yeah oh was it i see i didn't know that there's been a resurgence isn't there that there's there's like that they have they released it again or something and they're like oh it's the old school hat yeah i've got an original i've got an original one mate yeah mate have you still got yours um 
Yeah. Yeah, I've uh, I've still got it. Yeah. It's at my mum's house. I don't wear yes. it. Yes. <laughs> oh, you know, you need to get that back, mate. Bring it back. What more about the Orvis now? Um the what? Orvis. Are you, are you are you looking at the video that we're on? Listeners won't be able to see this, but I've got a, No, I, got an Orvis I hat. Turn on. Oh, you can't see turn me the either. Video off because we were getting lag. Yeah, ah. no, I can see again. I'll just turn my phone back on. Go on. Okay. This is boring for the listener, isn't it? But uh, all this. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, man. I like it. Yeah. Anyway, but back onto the topic of um, you know rigs and presentation. Do you ever look at how your lines enter the water, like how they go into your swim? Say you've got your your spot that you're fishing do you think about well okay well my angle my the angle of my line is this way maybe that's not good maybe i'll have my rods over here and i'll approach it from a slight different angle or maybe you're you're fishing up tight to like a, a weed bed or um a set of pads or or reeds or something do you look at the, the like your line lay like that um or is that not something that that bothers you too much yeah, definitely. So, uh, like with with line lay uh, and going through the water, if I think where my line's entering the water, any line that's sort of in the water column, I guess that's not sort of on the lake bed or sort of like above above the lake. If I think that's on like a patrol route of the fish, especially if I'm fishing close in to a close close in feature, um, I'll try and fish. Um, either slack slack to it or I'll be back leading um, so I'm trying to conceal that line and keeping it as much of it on the deck as possible um, yeah it's interesting what you're saying about angles as well uh, angles is something I think about quite a lot when I'm fishing and I'll try and position myself um, on the bank side I guess if I'm fishing to a certain feature I'll try and position myself um, so I've got like a, a good angle uh, to the feature and that isn't a good angle just for like ease of casting to it's um and like you were saying about the line lay um and if i think i'm going to get a better line lay from that angle or that the angle i'm at isn't going to interfere with my sort of perceived um patrol route of the fish then I'll, I'll certainly do that as well um it's all part of i guess us being discreet um yeah it's like another thing i'm, I'm quite paranoid about is i can Especially if I was doing a day session somewhere, I can set my rods, especially if I'm fishing close in, I can set my rods up and then I'm as far away as possible from them. So I'll set up like my chair and stuff down the bank, sort of as far away as I can, sort of safely. Um, so I'm not creating any sort of noise on the bank. Um, I think it's all sort of similar. So, um, But one thing, so this is what gets me. So I mentioned my friend Jordan earlier with his loaf of bread like fling them into the lake and I'm just like what is this guy doing um, now he has got a real real knack for catching fish and I guess he does it in a way that I sort of take the piss out of him because he's I'd, I'd say he's got no sort of finesse or uh, about it but he where possible so he 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 fishes sort of braided mainline like wherever possible um, and he will fish that bowstring tight to the lead bowstring tight and he'll catch fish after fish after fish and i'll be like mate like you can't like that is gonna spook fish and bloody blah, blah but he'll have none of it um i know you're like me you like your line concealment you'll fish slack sort of wherever you can sam um, and he will fish bowstring tight and he will catch fish after fish um and he is convinced with the indication side of things that sort of you're missing so many pickups and stuff from mm. from slack line that um it's not worth doing. I don't know what your thoughts are on it, mate. Has it yeah. changed over the years? or Yeah, I think he's right, for sure. you got to think as well. So there's, there's two trains of thought. I mean, if we're trying to go down the route of we don't want the carp to know that we're there, then a like bowstring tight line is not the way to go. But the other school of thought is, well, how about if that is bowstring tight, they bump into it, it's a solid thing, that they know it's there, are they going to be as spooky? Are they going to like selectively feed around? I don't know. There's, I've still got a big question mark over this. I, I would generally think, well, okay, they know the lines there. Maybe they know they're being fished for. Maybe they don't actually have that level of intelligence. 
but maybe they know something's not quite right, so they're going to feed more precautiously. Um, maybe that's the case, uh, and maybe that's why it works. I think, I think we do get picked up and 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 spat out more than we realise. I mean, God, me and you, Pete, countless times we've watched fish in the snags or not in the snags, sorry, uh, from a from a tree or wherever. We've watched fish pick up our bait and spit it out, right? Every everyone's seen that. I think it's happening a lot, and I think when you've got a real tight line, that that the the hook link needs to tighten, and then the lead only needs to be lifted off a little bit, and it almost acts as like a slingshot where it's hitting that hook home. So I think I think you're gonna hook more carp on a bowstring tight. Uh, line if that makes sense if if to the point where let's say there's there's a if you're using mono there's there's a lot of that stretch is taken up or let's say you're using braid let's say you the tip of your rod is bent and there's tension there i think as soon as that leg moves that is gonna you know forcefully power the hook down isn't it are you with me so far does that yeah. make sense mm-hmm so I think yeah, yeah. I think it could be from several angles. I think it could be that. So they, they can't, you know, quote unquote, get away with it as much. I think maybe, I think that's probably mostly it. I, th- I think they just can't get away with it as much as, as, as perhaps they would do otherwise. Um, it's, I mean, to be honest, yeah, I, I, I like the idea of a slack line if I can. But the reality is there's not many scenarios of my fishing that I can have a slack line unfortunately um because i'm fishing you know weed or far out or snags or you know it's pretty pretty rare i fish a proper slack line to be honest no yeah i'm i'm sort of yeah i'm with you um recently so sort of like the lake i've been fishing i've been fishing sort of one of my spots has been really close in but the margins are just super super deep um i've actually found a spot that's probably three or four foot deep um but then the sort of like the the margin sort of really drops down beneath me um so obviously fishing a slack line sort of there is not ideal because you've actually got a huge amount of slack between you and the fish Mm. uh, or you and your bait um so i've just sort of been back leading on the back of the shelf as it drops down from there and sort of tightening up yeah Uh, but now yeah my train of thought now i've i i try and fish just concealment isn't it if i can back lead and i'm confident that my leader from my lead to wherever my back lead may be if my leader whichever length section whether it's two and a half foot three foot whatever it is is pinned down Mm. then i'm happy i'm Mm. happy to fish tight if that's sort of concealed um other than that i try and i try and go slack um i'm not fishing big weedy waters like you um a lot of the time so i don't have to worry about that so much is is there like a certain amount of your line or your leader or what have you that you're like okay i need that amount to be on the deck do you have like a minimum amount that you want nailed down to the lake bed i mean yeah i guess so i want all my leader which is, I mean, I fish with leaders of varying lengths in different situations, but ideally I want my leader sort of on the lake bed. It's hard, you, you don't know if, exactly what's going on down there, but I could say fish with a, say I'm, I'm quite close in, I can fish with like a semi-slack line, so I can sort of slack in it off and you sort of get a feel. I'm never going to know whether uh, the leader's kicking up or not. Um, you can use like some uh, putty sort of on the line above the leader, um as well to sort of sink the line um but i'll try and back lead where i can um if i especially if i'm fishing close in i'll try and back lead because i know that's it's um i think it's safer um in certain ways um especially if you're fishing sort of helicopter style and you're relying on that leader coming up i don't really like using so much putty on the line um do you worry about indication with a back leader well, I think with a back lead, I can fish a tighter line. So I think I'm getting better indication and a slack line. It's interesting, isn't it? I, something else that's sort of in my head right now, and and don't even know if I've ever spoken about it to you, Pete, or not. But I think, and again, we're going to go on to baits here. I think 
you can, I don't know how to wear this. Sometimes you can get away with a, a poorly designed hookup presentation. So let, let's say, a, you know, a slack line setup compared to a bowstring tight setup. You, you, you it, It's not really geared to hammer home those, all of the takes, for, for want of a better phrase. Probably not explaining this well. It's like five beers in at this point. But um, I, th- <laughs> I, I, th- I think you can somewhat mitigate that. You can overcome that by having a bait that they are just so switched onto and eating so ravenously that a lot of the other mechanics and, you know, times that they, that, that they you know, get away with it. I think a lot of that can be negated by just using a, a really good bait. And I'm not on about just buying the best boiler you can. I'm not on about using like sticky baits, krill or something as, as great as I'm sure it is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you can, you can, you can take further measures, measures to, to get a really, really attractive bait that they want to keep on eating with gusto. I think again, for me, I, I'm, I'm, I'm more about bait. So I think you can really create a situation where they are feeding hard and yeah, you, you, you might not have the best indication method going because you, you're slack lining and you've got a back lead on because you want it all to be, you know, pinned down and, and out of their way. And a lot of people like maybe your mate, Jord, who sounds like a very good angler would look at that and say, your indication isn't going to be there. There could be fish picking up, picking you up and putting you down. You wouldn't know. Maybe that's the case. But if you can get them feeding and really going for it, really, you know, ripping up the bottom, as we used to say, um, I think that becomes negated. It becomes a non-issue. And, and I think, you you know, you just get those screamers no matter what your presentation. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. And it just comes down to, doesn't it, it's fishing. And every day and every scenario can be completely different. Um, mm. But you can certainly put the odds in your favor. Yeah. And, and I suppose you could say, why not do both? Why not have an arrangement that, y- you know, they can't get away with it and your bait up in a way with a bait that they're, they're just eating like there's no tomorrow. Um, you know, you can yeah. do both, can't you? But look, hey, you know, a lot of the time they won't eat like that. Um, <laughs> you know, some days they, they just they just want to graze or, or not at all, of course. Um, but yeah, I think, do you know what I think, mate? Um, I think the, the biggest missed opportunity from most anglers isn't so much the like oh you need to be changing your rig ap- approach or the, the you know title slack or anything like that i honestly think it's feeding situations i think it's creating a feed situation i think um i think that's missing and i don't perhaps i'm not verbalizing it very well i just think that um you know figuring out what kind of thing really switches those fish on whether it's uh um you know a just as you could have a great bait out there, a great mix of baits, you could use a great liquid on top to aid out traction. That could work great. You could tweak that slightly, and it's the difference between between them eating it, you know, with confidence, and them eating it with, you know, real kind of gusto. And I think if you can hone that down and make that difference happen in front of you, they are so much easier to catch. And then I feel like you're 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 hooking arrangement and your presentation become less important so i think if you were to look at which lever is going to give you the best bang for your buck i think it's really figuring out how you can get those carp feeding with you know gay abandon <laughs> let's say does that make sense that that's 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 <laughs> what i'm trying to say i think yeah. i think that that's got the most mileage in it for people no i think i think you're right mate and i think that's sort of a a good way maybe to sort of um I think we need to do a, a, a bait uh, a bait episode or a couple I, of bait yeah. episodes. As well as that, I, I mate. I think you're right. Yeah, we, it needs to happen. As well as that, I had a thought earlier um, when you started to, to, to say a story. I, I was sort of shuddering. I didn't know what you were going to come out with. We should do an episode on uh, stories, different crazy stuff that's happened to us. Because um, I reckon that would be a bloody good episode. You remember Malcolm? He always said that me yeah. and you should write a book. And that was back in the day. <laughs> do you remember that? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Good old Malcolm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> we was yeah, just stupid, wouldn't we? Young, stupid. 
I mean, he was a good bloke, wasn't he? He sort of took us under his wing a little bit. Oh, uh, I like, yeah, I, I like Malcolm. Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we, we should do, we should have an episode where we're just talking about um, just the ridiculous stuff. We have got so many stories. You're, you've got a better memory than me. I just forget stuff. But um, mm-hmm. I reckon we could have a few episodes on <laughs> on ridiculous stuff. And I reckon it will probably be the best episodes we've ever done. Um, we still need to as well um, talk about our spooky stories. Oh, yeah. The spooky story. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Actually, I just... Can you remember um, my spooky story? Um... I don't, I don't want to delve into it on a pod too much because we can do it as, a, as mm. an episode at some point. But it was at, um, when we fished up a Tamar that one time. I've, I've never fished up a Tamar with you, have I? Yeah. Mm. We were going to fish somewhere else and it didn't transpire. Um, I think we did three nights or something up there. I Quite a long sesh for us. Not remember that. Up a Tamar? Actually, no. Yeah, it was definitely. Yeah, no, no, we were. I did. I did. Um, I remember I did a twenty-four hour now, old syndicate, and then when we went up to, we were gonna fish the the, the big res, but it didn't yeah. happen for whatever reason. We couldn't yeah. get access, so we just went there for a backup plan and did two nights there. First night was a bit. We set up in the dark. It was late because it was just everything went to pot, and we just arrived real late. Set up down by the dam. Uh, in the dark, and then we sort of walked round to the far, like the far end of the lake. It's a real trek, isn't it? Around the other side. What the Devon Devon Bank? Yeah, we fished the Devon Bank. <laughs> I don't remember I this, it. mate. I don't think this is me. No, I've never me? fished the Devon okay. Bank. Okay, well, <clears throat> <laughs> you have. I haven't. Shh. <laughs> no, I was always on the Cornwall Bank, mate. I, I've fished. I fished uh, up a Tamar twice i believe once on my own which was around christmas time uh and i had one out and then once with rootsy um and i blanked I don't yeah think no I... we we fished it Have we? we've um okay. oh, in those maybe. old folk we were going through those old photos together and there's a photo of both our bivvies sort of set up um you had it was like a tracker armo thing i remember you bought it and was so bitterly disappointed in it um are you on about um another reservoir near me no <coughs> no okay all right well anyway we've got those photos as well but that's with um that's with like the old brollies wasn't it like the yeah. 50 inches back in the day yeah okay all right well okay show me the photo because i don't believe you but anyway <laughs> go on what, what were you saying back on back on topic oh i've just um spent my spooky story um I, no no. We'd had a few beers. I basically what was having crazy dreams and stuff. Woke up with some freaky shit happening. Oh, okay. uh, but we'll yeah. save it for another episode. It's not as good as your spooky story. Yeah, save it for another one. I also remember down... Um, we, we're just doing a little teaser now. I remember down Porf. Do you remember that? Mm-hmm. With the, with the, yes. There was something that hit me in the face at night. And then yeah. in, in weirdly in the morning, there was the, the person. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Weird stuff. I think the thing is, you you like you do enough nights out. There's going to be some weird stuff happening. A lot of it can be explained, can't it? Um, but I think there's mm. a few things that that can't be. Anyway, we'll uh, we'll we'll save it for another episode. We'll um we'll do a little um stories episode, or maybe even a spooky episode. No, we can't do a super spooky episode. We don't have enough stories about it. We'll do a stories episode and we'll cover <laughs> it in there. How about that? That's it. Or we'll just drop in a story per episode, maybe. Cool. Anything else you wanna you wanna go over in this episode? Oh, there was one thing as well, and I'm sorry. I know we're rounding up, but I've got to bring it up very quickly. Do you remember the old solar leaders that had the? It was like fake weed. Yes, I <laughs> yes, had some. I, I had some of them, and I really liked them. What a unique thing! Yeah. Yeah, I do. I'm I'm sort of thinking of like, yeah, I remember it was sort of like a like a st- fine stringy weed on it, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Yeah, it, and I think oh, did it go? I don't think it went over your lead core. No, it was in place of your lead core, wasn't it? And it was. It was, yeah, it was, it was like just, a tubing. 
yeah, it was like this cottony stuff coming out, which, okay, in the water, it didn't necessarily look like weed, but it didn't look like line, um, and it wouldn't have felt like line to the touch. That was a real unique product. Um, again, if you got a rig and you're banging it out, it, you know, it's tang- likely to tangle, um, but just like dropping it in the edge. I really like that. I used to use it for a bit, if you remember, for my real margin margin style fishing, um, which I used to do a lot of. Um, but yeah, what a unique product. Um, I'd like to have some yeah, of them. You don't see that about anymore. You do not see that about anymore. No, it never really took off at the time, but I bet there's some applications for it, to be honest. <laughs> mm. I remember a long time ago, I was watching, talking of concealment and rig concealment. Um, I think it was a foreign angler, and it was like, whether it's in Belgium, fishing for sort of like a big sort of 80 90 pound common like an absolute freak of a fish um and he caught it and he actually his rig he molded putty all the way along it to make it look like a twig i mean it's gonna make that rig incredibly heavy <laughs> but I do mean, you, it worked do you remember the um, um the old um floating wood stuff Oh, I think that was by who was that by? Was it by Christon? Like the driftwood floating stuff for your line for for like floater fishing. Do you remember that? No. No, it was like it was this stuff you molded to your line to make it float. Um oh. I'll Google it. Yeah, no, I haven't got a clue. I think it was called uh Christon Driftwood. I might be wrong. You remember the old like Christ and Bogey? Yes. Yeah. I wonder if that's still in production. You could make sort of like a hook bait, can you? You could make like a little boilie with all your hemp or something. Uh I remember the name, I don't remember the application. What well, Yeah, it was like a um it was almost like a putty, I guess, but it was a bogey, it was like a green colour. Um, but you'd be able to get individual grains of hemp and stick them all to this like green bogey and you could like then stick a needle through it and use it like a boilie. Yeah, see, for me, I'd be worried about what that green bogey stuff, what kind of signal that was emitting to the carp. Yeah. Because that would be different, I imagine, than than just the hemp on their own. If you know yeah, I mean. that's like me with permanent markers. Like when you ah, people come on. do their hook points and then... Yeah. stick a permanent marker all over it i'm just like for me that's a no-no yeah it's a no-no cool i've googled it yeah it's it's um it's christ and driftwood floating casting putty it's this stuff you put on your line and it, it just makes your line float basically uh, all right you still <clears throat> buy it uh you can this is uh it's in euros so it's um, obviously somewhere in europe uh, it says Expresso Verdand aus Deutschland. Seed über Vorhan Jahan. Okay. There we go. Yes, yeah, somewhere in Europe. Yeah, maybe Germany by the sounds of it. Yeah, you can buy it. Um, I tell you what, going back now to the floater fishing, we talk about the little Drennan sort of controllers. Yeah. What I found with them is the fish would take them more than my hook bait, mate. Mm. the amount of times the fish would just you could see the fish come up and bam take the whole float in its mouth and take the float more than my hook bait is this on like a is this on a on a proper low like water is it on a low stock water or a, more of a runs water I guess more of a runs water but wherever I've sort of used it I've, it's always drawn attention from the fish and the fish mm. always sort of take it and then they'll take the float and you'll see the float will go 12 inches or however underwater and it really freaks the fish out and yeah but i used to find that a lot with that controller mm. yeah there we go all right buddy i think uh i think with exhausted rigs we could probably go on for some more but um yeah i think we're probably done on it is there anything else you want to go over nope no i think that's it like you say um we've had a bit of sort of feedback and interest and sort of some guys are king for some bait talk i think so we'll try yeah. and do a bait one for the next episode yeah i think so yeah we'll make it happen uh either next one will probably be a guest or it will be bait or stories uh one of those three we'll see what happens 
but uh, hopefully we'll we'll get it to you fairly soon um, during this time of COVID-19 coronavirus lockdown. We'll uh, we'll try and keep you more entertained than we have done in the past. So that's it. Thanks ever so much for listening thus far. Uh, please, if you can, just give us a minute. Go and leave us a review. It really, really does help us, and it's really nice for us to read those reviews. Um, any reviews we'll get, we'll we'll read out in the, in the following episodes as well. Uh, we'll make sure we'll do that on the next episode. So yeah, thanks ever so much, folks. We will catch you on the next one. You gonna say bye, Pete? No, that was fine. <laughs>